Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Day Zero Podcast. You may notice we've picked up a fossil on our way to the podcast today. Uh, Auntie is back with us. So I'm Spectre, with me is Z, and Auntie as well, which is nice to be able to say after a long while. Though he is only with us for about 30 minutes or so. Uh, he's going to have to bail out and do some stuff, so... Uh, you know, we have him for a little bit, but not for the full episode. Uh, but we've got quite a content-packed episode today in terms of topics. So, uh, yeah, let's just get right into the first one. So there was an article on Facebook um, about buying the Pegasus exploit oh, from, so for anybody Pegasus listening, from so um, long ago. If on Apple Insider, about Facebook. Yeah. Uh, just clarify that. Yeah, so... Obviously, I mean, this this group, NSO, has been known to sell spyware in the past to nation states and stuff like that. Uh, but the CEO of the NSO group uh, basically said that Facebook asked to purchase the rights of capabilities from Pegasus. So according to the CEO, Facebook was interested in Pegasus because they had their own app called Anova Protect, or Anova Protect, which I think we covered before um, back when, like, no, One so of the many we Facebook we were com- we on. covered um, uh, Facebook research, which was kind of like so. Anova Protect um, was banned from the apps Apple App Store in like somewhere in 2019. So to yeah. this hap- this event happened with Facebook reaching out to buy some functionality of Pegasus. Happened in 2017, 2019. Anova Protect was banned uh, sometime last year. I think it was during the summer. It was also removed from the Google Play Store, uh, which then led into Facebook Research, which was that VPN uh, that they kind of targeted towards, or apparently or allegedly targeted towards teens, and they would pay them like 20 bucks a month or whatever. Actually, they might have targeted like 18 plus teens, not not like 13 to 18. I'm not sure of the details on that, but it, it is slightly different uh, in terms of what type of information it was tracking, things like that. Yeah. So, you know, according to the CEO, they had went to buy the, you know, buy capabilities of Pegasus. Uh, and apparently it was because they were worried that their app was less effective on iOS compared to Android, which makes sense because iOS is like a lot more locked down in terms of privacy barriers and stuff like that than Android typically. Um, Facebook, if, you know, they kind of contradict this. They, they're they saying the statement is meant to distract people from the fact that Facebook is suing NSO, uh, which they started like half a year ago for exploiting vulnerabilities in WhatsApp. Um, but I, what I found interesting was they didn't outright deny the like allegation they just kind of said that oh this is just to distract you from the fact that we're suing them but like you know it's it's weird they don't outright deny it yeah well i mean they they probably it probably did happen but the thing is it's unrelated to the fact that they're suing nso group over the voip exploits and whatsapp um you know they're suing over one thing it's kind of unrelated over the fact oh well facebook also wanted to buy it it is unrelated so I mean, the fact that Facebook isn't denying it, I mean... I mean, it's hard to give Facebook the the benefit of the doubt after all the stuff they've been involved with. Um, Well, I don't don't think they need the benefit of the doubt. They very well could have tried to buy it. Yeah. Um, I mean, and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. I mean, people are immediately going to the fact, oh, well, Facebook's uh, just trying to twist. I think Andy had some thoughts on this. That's why we had brought him on. Yeah, no, I mean, I guess, uh, I don't know. I mean, I looked over the article uh, and I thought, you know, the two interesting parts were like the timeline, you know, like the 2017 is when they first, it sounds like, approached them to to buy, you know, the specific stuff for uh, Onavo or Onavo, however you pronounce it, Protect. Um, so I, I think, you know, what's kind of weird is, uh, you know, the timing. I probably agree with Facebook in that they're probably doing it just because they're being sued. So it's perfect, you know, kind of cannon fodder. But like, I, I think the uh, weird part is um, now that they're suing them, like my weird twitchy responses that maybe, you know, if I had to guess, this sounds like something that Facebook was investigating and probably heard about, again, the exploits that are available, so on and so forth, and was like, well, how do we go and approach this group without seeming like we're investigating them? You know, so what better way than to go and kind of push for something that you're doing and go and say, hey, you know, we'd like to use this to see if we can further our capability, you know? Um, so part of me just believes that it was like kind of a, a 
way to probably, you know, still leverage what they'd find from the NSO group, but also be able to fill those kind of like uh, holes in their capabilities. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, well, and I kind of agree with you. It does seem like, you know, Facebook's a company that's already spending a lot of time trying to track users, trying to get information. Um, can you mute yourself, Andy? Uh, we're getting yes, some background sorry. noise. Uh, so Facebook's already spending a lot of time trying to gather a lot of information. No doubt they have a lot of very smart people trying to do so. So it does seem a little bit suspicious that they're coming to uh, NSO group to try and track users. Uh, like, like it just feels like this is something that Facebook should probably or probably does already know. And that, as you were saying, there's probably another reason that led to them actually approaching NSO group. Uh, and I think it very well could have been relayed to them trying to get like threat intelligence on what NSO group was doing rather than it being relayed to them actually wanting to utilize the techniques out of the malware. So you think it's less malicious in nature than it seems? I'm willing to give Facebook that benefit of the doubt in a sense. Uh, that I don't think Facebook was looking to just start spreading spyware. I, I mean, I, that that just doesn't, at least to me, it doesn't really fit with, and I'm not saying like Facebook is this completely uh, trustworthy company or anything. It's just as a legitimate company, it doesn't seem likely to me that they were looking to actually, you know, just start using the spyware. And to be clear, they do only ask to use parts of Pegasus, not the entire thing. I mean... It's worth the noting that they also are worth how many billions of dollars, you know, and their whole business model is built on, you know, not not spying on users, but collecting data on their users. So I'd be surprised to feel like they need to go to a group like NSO group to figure out ways to do that. You know, it just seems a little silly, not to say that it isn't something they could have done, but, you know, the more we look at it, the more it just seems like, why would they even need to go that far? Um, it'd be a perfect guise, though, to be able to say, hey, we need it for, you know, the privacy aspect. We can't get through some of these controls. But it is totally possible, too, uh, to be fair as well, that they maybe didn't have that capability. Yeah, I don't I... know. Go ahead. I kind of feel like a lot of people are leaving Facebook with all the, the PR, like, you know, battles that they've had with over the past couple of years, all the stuff they've tried to pull, like with the VPN app, for example, uh, that we were talking about earlier. I mean... I think they are having a harder time now collecting the data that they used to be able to collect. So it does seem possible that they would want to go that like extra step to try to get more data where they couldn't, they can't get as much now as they could before. Yeah, but this kind of this was in twenty seventeen though. Like this wasn't like Facebook yeah, but approached then, them now. Like, this Facebook was, was still kind of like uh, Facebook being had a lot of access because they still had their an overprotect on the App Store, which gave them a ton of access. It was in 2019 that Apple changed their terms uh, that stopped allowing, basically stopped allowing Facebook to actually know information about like what apps are running and all that detailed information that they would have wanted to collect. Uh, so if this were more recent, but in 2017 they would have had a lot of this information just from the people already installing their application. Okay. And I mean, could you imagine what would happen if it were found out that Facebook was legitimately just installing malware? Like, I mean, honestly, as a legitimate... is it much worse than stuff they've already done? <laughs> it, it is in terms of the outlook from pretty much everybody. Because if you find out, oh, Facebook's just... You know, Facebook's collecting a lot of information. You're using their application. There's a, I want to say implied consent when you start using Facebook. Obviously, there's a ton of websites that tend to include Facebook. Like, there's a lot of tracking and information that they're able to get without that. But basically, as a legitimate company, I'm not expecting Facebook to go about breaking the law and actually jailbreak some random person's devices, which Pegasus does. Yeah, uh, being given a link through me it's mentioned right in the document uh, using Pegasus, you know, results in the target device being jailbroken and the malware being loaded to monitor and steal data. It, it's one thing for Facebook to be collecting information. It's a completely different thing for Facebook to actually do so in a criminal, in a outright criminal manner. But I guess my question is, if they were doing this for threat intel, like you're saying, I mean, 
how does this really help them in any way? Like, what are they going to do with that? Being aware of exploits being used against them would be one case. But Pegasus um, was already known. Like Pegasus the, the was known, not necessarily all there. the details. In 2017, I, I'm going to uh, assume that they sure. continue to update yeah. Pegasus. I, I can't imagine that they use the same exploits now that they used in 2017, or that they'd be using the same exploits in 2017 that they were using in 2015 or 2016. Or That's I mean, true. this is something that NSO groups continuing to sell. I have to assume that part of this process includes you know updates but those what? exploits don't affect facebook like that's why i'm well, just the, a bit weird nso on group was using attacks on whatsapp though which does involve facebook okay yeah that's true that's good yeah fair enough uh yeah. sorry auntie we we're gonna say something no it's good i think i was just about to say what he he said basically is that you know like while it doesn't directly go after them didn't they have capability to scrape you know users information from like at least whatsapp and you know they may not have told the public their uh, capabilities right up the way so they may have had you know functionality to steal facebook stuff and you know other products belonging to facebook so i mean i just the the, the simple part of it though is i find it funny weirdly enough that i'd ever agree with facebook on the fact that you know it's weird that they would suddenly throw this out there when they knew years ago that if it was such an issue you know um i i do find it weird also though that if facebook was trying to you know go and find more private information of their users you know it's like going to try and protect your house with security cameras and being like actually i'm going to go to the colombian drug cartels and buy ak-47s to protect my house instead <laughs> like it's such a weird step to it does that make sense yeah i don't know so uh, obviously i don't work in threat intelligence so perhaps you'll correct me on this but it feels like it would be kind of up their alley if say facebook's internal threat team you know just finds out that nso groups may be doing something against facebook now i'm actually going to walk back my prior statement it wouldn't make a lot of sense if nso group were actually like had exploits targeting facebook that they would then sell those exploits to facebook so I'm well, going exactly. to walk back kind of my statement on that, that odds are they weren't going for how weren't necessarily looking for that. Because if they were, they would probably approach NSO group under the cover of some other group. I, I think, uh, or, sorry, you know, they could have, no, you, they could have gone over it a billion ways. I mean, the, the idea of threat intelligence, right, is to, to stop threats. And like some companies like Facebook are probably a little fast and loose with it. So they come up with some coy idea of like, hey, let's go and tell them it's just for this. I mean, I, I if I had to guess the way they wanted it to pan out was that they were probably going to get in there. First off, they may have taken the capabilities. They may have very well done that to spy on users more and stuff like that. But I think it also could have been like one of those things that, you know, NSO group, if they signed up Facebook as a client, it's kind of awkward to then be offering functionality to steal your client's crap. Like, you know, you can't, you can't be like, oh, well, now our latest version of this malware that we've created steals Facebook user accounts or WhatsApp. Like, it's probably a little more sketchy on that end. So they, it could have been just a weird roundabout way to get them to stop targeting Facebook and its, you know, other companies, if you think about it. It could have been. I mean, I, the thing is, Facebook does have a lot of money to throw around, too. Um, yeah. So that that kind of just ties in with, as you were saying, with being a little bit fast and loose on that. You know, just come up with some idea and give it a try. I, I don't know how much money actually goes towards thread and tell with Facebook. But given kind of the size of Facebook, I wouldn't be surprised to find out if there's a pretty substantial amount there. Uh, but honestly, I mean, it. on a whole, I do, I do agree with you, Anta, that it feels weird. Like, this is the timing for NSO Group releasing that information. Obviously, it's released as part of the court uh court documents so it's not like you know nsl group just like did immediate leak but i don't know to me looking at it from the outside i'm not a lawyer i don't know the intimate details here it does feel more or less unrelated only showing that maybe they had a uh like client relationship with facebook it seems uh, like they just want to get a shot in at Facebook. yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah um, I mean, obviously, like, a lot of the stuff we've been talking about is speculation. We don't know, like, all the hard details. Maybe we will see more come out through that lawsuit, like, in the future. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, it is, like, kind of a weird story. Uh, maybe we'll find out more later. Um, that being said, I think we can move on to uh, some Zoomer stuff. Um, so, Zoom has had some pretty bad PR over the last week. And 
this is the first of many courses related to our feast on Zoom in this episode. And part of the reason Zoom has gotten so much attention lately is due to the self-isolation with, you know, current world events, um, it's being used a lot by companies and governments and lots of other places for meetings. So Zoom has had uh, security incidents in the past. Um, so, you know, researchers have started looking at it more closely uh, due to it being used so much lately. And these researchers discovered some issues, and that's because Zoom seems to have some disingenuous claims related to crypto uh, that are either not, don't seem to be true at all or seem to be misleading. Disingenuous or possibly just misunderstanding, like written by somebody that doesn't understand. That's possible. Uh, like mark marketing, maybe doing a lot of that. And and I come at that just because they talk about. So one of the things brought up in this is end to end encryption. Zoom claims or has claims about their end to end encryption, and like immediately following those claims, uh, Zoom ends up talking about uh, like TLS being used, which TLS is definitely crypto, but. Generally speaking, like end to end is going to be a par from your standard TLS. Uh, I'm trying to find the picture I'm thinking of in the document, but well, I think the other issue is only the key exchange happens over TLS. I don't even think the the actual packet exchange happens over TLS. Am I am I wrong on that or? I'd have to look into it, but I have to imagine that if because um, Zoom does have a web interface, so it's going to have to be over HTTPS. So here's the here's the like diagram I was looking at. So they have observing a test Zoom call. Um, I don't know if it scroll down for you, but um, they have like gets key over TLS. But then the meeting, it says it's encrypted with AES over UDP, but like okay, so that, that's just separate being from with a AES key is not like end to end encryption. Yeah, no, like their whole end-to-end -end encryption is definitely wrong, but it seems like it's just somebody that doesn't understand what end-to-end -end encryption actually is, and that yeah. could be intentionally misleading, or it could not. Other things uh, that are mentioned in here are that they're using AS-256, in reality it looks like they're using AS-128, and they're using ECB mode. Um, if you're not familiar with the ECB mode... Actually, they have the classic picture in this article. Uh, classic picture is basically with ECB mode, it takes a key um, and basically just applies it to the block. So AS is a cipher, or block cipher, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say cipher block, but it's a block cipher. So what happens is it splits up whatever your message is, whatever you want encoded, it gets split up into equal size blocks. And then the key, when... You could apply the key in several different ways. You could, for example, apply the key to the first block and then apply the second block to the following block and kind of chain them along. ECB mode basically takes the key, applies it to the block. Uh, so there's no connection between any of the following blocks. Uh, so what ends up happening is you end up with these pat. If you have patterns in your data, if, if two blocks are the same, the result in ciphertext will be the same. Uh, so that's only really an issue if you have data that's going to be repeating. Uh, so the classic example is this very much like uncompressed bitmap of the Tux penguin. And you'll notice even when it's encrypted, if you're able to see our video, that you can kind of make out the outline of Tux. You can see kind of the original image or parts of the original image, even though it's technically encrypted. So that's why ECB is. mode is a problem, but the reality is when we're talking about audio, odds are you're not having a lot of that sort of completely repeating blocks. Uh, you know, people are going to speak differently. The audio data is going to be continually changing. So there are things that could be pulled out. Uh, you can get information such as cadence of packets uh, to kind of get cadence of what's being spoken. There are definitely things that you can leak because of ECB mode, but... The risk isn't huge in a lot of cases with ECB mode. The, the problem with ECB is less ECB and more the fact that if you're using it, odds are ECB is not the most significant problem in your crypto. It's a code smell or it's the crypto equivalent. Well, of the code it's, smell. it's definitely an issue. It's generally an issue because when you see it's the easiest uh, block mode to use. 
uh, pretty much all the other options require some other settings, usually like an initialization vector. That would just be like some starting value so that every every encrypted instance ends up starting different. And so they'll always kind of be different even when data is the same. Uh, so you'll use an IV for that. Uh, they, they need some further data, whereas doing ECB mode, you need a key and you need the data. It's kind of that classic what you think of crypto if you don't really understand how crypto works. It's like you think that's what you need, the data, and you need a key. Uh, so people who end up using that tend to be the type of people who don't really know the difference. They just know what they want. They want this crypto. Therefore, they use the easiest thing available. Yeah. So there was also another issue that they said they discovered in the waiting room feature. Um, but they're not disclosing it yet because they want to wait until it's fixed um, because of the risk it could pose to users. But they said they are going to uh, disclose it when it's been fixed and everything. So uh, we may see that on like a future episode. We can go a little bit more into the specific specifics of that issue. I think what the most worrying part of this article was, was the shady findings where the keys were actually being sent through Chinese servers. Even when none of the meeting participants nor the company hosting the meeting were based in China. So uh, they gave an example of a test between a user from the US and from Canada, and the key ended up making its way through uh, to one of the participants through a Beijing server. And what makes this really suspect is China can make it so that Zoom is legally obligated to disclose those keys to Chinese authorities. So, I Which mean, is the immediate thought when you hear the key going through there. And we know it's not end-to-end -end encrypted. And to be fair, I'm, I am going to mention, so I've used Zoom a fair bit well prior to this. I never, real, I didn't even realize they made the claim of being end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, it, basically, they can't be end-to-end -end encrypted. And I will mention that outright. Like, they can't do ETE simply because you can call into it. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, so literally call aspects. into it. So because of that there's no way you could do end-to-end -end encryption zoom needs to be able to decrypt it uh, in order to let people call in yeah but considering zoom is being used by governments and stuff like that uh you know the fact that those keys are being routed through chinese servers when nobody's in the meeting is in china is like i think it's probably the most worrisome part of the article um, yeah it does seem a little bit aside. just like a poor routing choice rather than necessarily a design to go through china that said it's absolutely sketchy i mean it could there could be a benign reason and apparently zoom has updated this uh such that it no longer will do that but was there no way they could like i don't know do a few more test cases just to show like is it only one time and then they showed like okay it's going through china or, you know, well, that's it... the thing. I think they had to make multiple attempts until one actually went through China. It wasn't every key going through China. They don't make their claim isn't that hard. OK, that's all I was saying. It's like, you know, if it was every single key, then I'd be like, wow, that's. Oh, I'd be shitty. way more <laughs> concerned about it if it <laughs> was know, every like, key. They're like, oops, did we send every key to ourselves? Damn it. We do that every time. Like, <laughs> you know, like, I would have been like, all right. Something's... Well, so it seems like all the keys originate from Zoom. So it's not even sending it to themselves because they generate the key yeah so i mean i i feel like the most creepy part i mean if anyone wants a good chuckle to themselves the thread intel twitter sphere has fought itself over and over again the past couple of weeks about like if these things are truly bad or if it's a bunch of people just being a-holes you know um because oh there's like, absolutely cloud chasing when it comes to zoom right now <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah we'll get into that a bit later <laughs> I, I, i'm sad that i can't be there for it but i will say i've seen it all over the place and that i i do feel bad that while i don't trust zoom my company even um pushed out that we all had to uninstall it and we migrated to something else you know it, it's kind of uh fascinating to see people pile on it but you know at the end of the day like what other thing can you use at this point that has any consistency like i know people mentioned like jitsi and other i, I think it's the only one i really you, heard you could use the uh what is it apache open meetings <laughs> oh no apache open <laughs> i mean yeah i'm sure that's a very uh crowd favorite nowadays you could use you google know? hangouts i mean you know then, we... you know you just well i mean if you're cons <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know that's fair <laughs> I, you know but i mean which one's really worse i did like the um i did like the photo from the tmux changed over to the ecb mode that's probably the only like 
a good example of why it's weak, but I, I did want to point out it's a lot harder to reconstruct audio than it is like a, a photo or something like that that you kind of mentioned, Z. Like, yeah, that's all I was getting at. Doing audio, like this sort of attack isn't huge against the audio. There are other pieces of metadata information you can pull out. But the key issue with ECB is really when you have this sort of repeating data. Yeah, so no, I, I just thought that was a good point. And so hopefully, you know, the only uh, anecdotal thing that I thought was the best of all of it was that uh, the, was it Boris Johnson? He was, him and his crew were uh, having a nice call over Zoom, but he left the Zoom meeting ID for everyone. And, uh, you know, besides all the Zoom bombing nonsense, I thought that must be pretty good if they are really scraping all these keys and decrypting converse, uh, conversations, that it must be fantastic just to have someone so easily link where to target them at that must have been a real joy well so i believe the meeting id was tweeted after the meeting actually happened that said obviously meeting ids can be reused uh but i believe it was tw it was tweeted out by somebody else obviously it wasn't actually tweeted out by uh boris johnson um, it was tweeted show, out man. by you know, whoever, you know, whoever does social media with. It, it, it doesn't have to be you. It always can be part of your crew, you know? It's the one that sinks you <laughs> oh, down. Oh, I, I just mean, like, with that, <laughs> it happened after the fact. It happened after the meeting. Right. I don't believe it happened during. Maybe I'm mistaken on that, but I, I remember it kind of coming up on its own. Well, I'll before I jump off here, I'll give my final resting statements on it so that you guys can crap on them later. More. Well, I, I did want to ask you one more mm -hmm. thing, Auntie. So um, would you be able to stay on for like a few more minutes? Yeah, like, yeah. Okay. I, okay. The, the people who have kidnapped me will take the gun away in a second. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, you can give your finishing thoughts on that. But I did have one other thing I wanted to bring up with a different topic as well. But uh, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, sure. No, and I'll, I'll let you if you have any other questions on any other topics before I go, I'm happy to answer them. Um, no, I was just going to say, you know, since the people have crapped on it so much, Zoom for a lot of reasons sucks, and I don't like using it because I don't trust it. But at the same time, like, I do feel bad that I guess in New York, the, uh, I think it was the governor uh, forced schools that they can't use Zoom anymore because of the concerns. But, I mean, I haven't seen, like, a, a, of all the campaigns that I currently watch, and, you know, I don't see anyone targeting Zoom the way that people have blown it up. So I feel bad genuinely that even as a Chinese company, they – they probably are sketchy a little bit, but I don't know if they definitely deserve like the widespread hate of like, you know, these guys are stealing your keys, decrypting your conversation. Like, I doubt they care, really. And I think for the most part, they just didn't expect so many people to start using it. But uh, I don't know. I just feel bad. I yeah, really they mentioned they actually they have a blog post with just their insane growth recently. I forget what the numbers are, but it was very significant usage now. Uh, that said, I will mention they own some Chinese companies. I don't believe... I believe they are like Zoom itself is a registered company in the U.S. Though, yeah, they're a U.S. company and they own some Chinese companies. And so, you know, as with all analyses, if it is if there's anything China in it, it's like oh, it must be like a Chinese APT group or something crazy. <laughs> well, Ch China hasn't given any like the Chinese government hasn't given anybody any reason to give them the benefit of the doubt with any anything they're connected with. So. I've never heard them do anything bad to anyone. Okay, you can yeah. take that to the bank. <laughs> All right. Please don't kill me. How much money are you getting paid? <laughs> 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 but uh, anyway, I'm gonna do a last minute topic switcheroo just because you do have to go here in a few minutes. Um, I wanted to bring up the uh, Mozilla advisory. So there's not too much to talk about here because the technical details are actually locked off but there were there were some security vulnerabilities that were put out about firefox um one was a use after free through race condition and the ns stock shell de uh, destructor and the other one was another race condition yielding use after free when handling a readable stream so you know these are obviously they're both uh, firefox issues uh we don't have the technical details and i think those bug references are probably going to be locked off forever i don't think mozilla ever opens them up to the public um but what made this notable was uh they noted that the targeted attacks uh there's targeted attacks in the wild that are abusing these vulnerabilities um and i think i thought that was interesting to see on firefox because typically when you see that notice on browsers it's safari or chrome because those are the default browsers on mobile operating systems so I think it's interesting to see targeted attacks hitting Firefox, where Firefox doesn't necessarily have the greatest market share when you're talking about um, browsers. So I was wondering, Anti, do you think this could possibly be targeted attacks on Tor users? Because I know Tor uses Firefox under the hood, right? 
Yes, it does. A Tor I browser mean, does. Technically, Tor, you can, yeah, you can browser, use yes. other browsers. Yes, by default, the Tor browser that everyone gets is using Firefox as its base, right? Um, now, are, so you're asking specifically if it's likely that it's uh, towards uh, Tor users or just in general targeting people? Yeah, I was just wondering if, like, you think that the these attacks that are using these vulnerabilities could be going after, like, Tor users. Like, you know, so let's say journalists potentially using a, a Tor for anonymity or something like that. Hell yeah, dude. Are you kidding me? I mean, I, I can't say, let me clarify first and foremost, that I can't 100% say right now that that's happening because I haven't. No one, obviously, if they're being very hush-hush about it, this happens every time when someone goes, well, there's a campaign out there. Like, what does that mean? Who is it? You know, so... um I don't know 100% what that means in terms of this, this specific one, but you know it would be silly in my eyes for any nation state, especially some of the more proactive ones targeting uh, various individuals right within the dark web who use Tor browser and stuff like that. It would be almost nonsensical for them not to leverage that, right? Now, assuming that that's what this lends its capability towards, right? Targeting users um, and exploiting them, which it sounds like it does. You know, if you look at most of, at least from my understanding, the targeting of Tor users, a lot of the exploits haven't even been sophisticated or relatively new, right? It's always been people using outdated browsers and shit. I, I don't think for the most part, you're gonna see like a lot of exploits getting dropped on Tor users that are relatively new. Uh, maybe attacking the service itself, but for this specifically to answer your question, yeah, I mean, if it's something that targets to or Firefox, which is what Tor browser is based off of, I would be surprised if they just decided no, unless they've got so many um, exploits available. But even then, again, it's just something to add to your arsenal, you know. Um, so I 100%, uh, it would be an easy just addition to anything. That's assuming they can get the information out there. We don't know enough about the campaign and what details are out there. So it may not even be applicable just yet if it's something that was only partially observed, you know? Yeah, which is, uh, okay. I think, fair point on that. I mean, I, we can't know for sure who was being targeted with it. I think it's reasonable to say that the Tor browser is one of the juicier targets if you are writing the ODA, using it in the wild. That said, the Firefox users can also be, generally, are going to be a little bit more technically oriented. So it can also just be a position thing, where maybe the Firefox user also happens to be a sysadmin with access to more stuff, or other reasons why you might target it. So it could be unrelated to Tor. Yeah, okay, fair enough. I was just curious on Antti's take, because I didn't know how common those types of attacks were. Um, so I, yeah, I just, uh, you know, I wanted to get that in before you left. Cause I imagine you're probably, are you going to jump out now, Antti, or are you good for another little while? Uh, I'll probably jump out now, but yeah, I mean, to summarize, yeah, you'll, you'll see if it doesn't get released, I don't think you'll use seeing it used, uh, against a lot of average users because most botnet owners and people, you know, targeting regular people often need the actual PSG code itself. So, but yeah, no, um. Hopefully no one gets targeted. So that's it from me. I'll uh, hop off and I'll have to listen later for you guys crapping on the other people. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, y'all. Have a good one. All right. So uh, we'll, we'll jump into the uh, bug bounty platforms topic. So uh, we have a topic by CSO, and it's basically saying bug bounty platforms by researcher silence violate labor laws, critics say. So, you know, one topic we've talked about a lot on this show is bug bounties and whether or not disclosure should be allowed. And generally, I think we agree it's reasonable to some degree that vendors have the final say on when a report goes public or if it does at all after it's been reported through a bounty program. Well, it seems that's being challenged so a little you're, bit. So uh, you're, I, I at least want to say, I, th I think, and I want to be really clear, ideal world, full transparency, everyone has bounties. Uh, Sorry, you know, can you repeat that for a sec? You cut out and I didn't hear yeah, so properly. Yeah, so in an ideal world, we'll have full transparency, all vulnerability reports become made public, and everybody has bounties. That's kind of your ideal case, I believe. Uh, but we don't, we get there step by step. Uh, we're not at that point yet, obviously. And actually, I will, I will step that back a little bit. Maybe not every company has bounties. I do believe bounties are something that should be introduced once the, once your security is fairly mature. You don't want to just have somebody, oh, I just wrote this over the weekend. Well, hey, here's you know a hundred bucks for every bug you find, and like, you know, put them out of business. Yeah, you end up throwing money away. Yeah, like it's it's part of the maturity process to end up adding a bounty in. 
Uh, but ideal world is generally speaking, once they're ma speaking about mature companies, companies that have a mature security process, vulnerabilities should be disclosed publicly. Um, and, and they should have a bounty. Uh, and I do also want to, just as we get started on this, draw a really quick distinction because we're going to be talking about like NDAs and uh, agreements uh, before you're even able to start testing and stuff. Uh, that there is, there's two kind of types of applications you could be testing. This is a very wide description, but either an application that, that is hosted by somebody else. So if you're testing Facebook, you're not self hosting Facebook or PayPal or something like that. You're not self-hosting those things. Somebody else is hosting it. So in order for you to test, you need their permission. Otherwise, it's unauthorized access. And the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in the US is insanely vague when it comes to actually defining what unauthorized access is. Uh, although I think actually some of that may have changed recently. There was something about the terms of service not being as binding. Although I know there have been cases where terms of service have basically been, well, you violated the terms of service, therefore all your access was unauthorized and it was computer fraud and abuse all of a sudden. Uh, I think something about that changed. I don't follow a lot of the legal cases, so maybe I'm wrong. But generally speaking, I'm just going to be speaking under that assumption, unauthorized access. If you don't have permission to be hitting that hosted application, that's somebody else hosting it. The other type of application you can be testing are self-hosted things. Things that you could run locally if you want to test Android, if you want to uh, like work on your Android phone, you could do that. Or Linux, your operating system, uh, running a web server locally. You can test all of that kind of self-hosted. You can do whatever you want on those servers. It doesn't matter what the NDA is. You're breaking no laws by doing that local testing. Well, if you violate yeah. their DMCA can come in. There are some things, but generally speaking, you're not violating any laws by doing that sort of local testing. Uh, I just want to bring that up because when we talk about bounties, most of them are these hosted applications. Some of them are self-hosted. And I think a lot of what we're, what's going to come up really has to do more with the hosted applications which is most bounties that you see on a program like hacker one or bug crowd okay so bringing up the point you were saying earlier with like in an ideal world everyone would have bounties it actually seems like um some researchers are challenging that a little bit they're pushing for vulnerability discovery programs instead of bug bounties i it there's a little bit of like a different uh term like uh set of rules with that it's a bit more like you can't uh outsource it I think. Are, are you sure ISO about standards. that? Because I thought it was vulnerability disclosure programs, not discovery, which is a, a different part of the process. Because they talk um, about VDP, which is vulnerability disclosure policy. Oh, sorry, that's what I meant. VDP. Okay, yeah. so VDP though is slightly different. VDP is, and this article actually I think just makes a mistake, kind of conflating VDP with coordinated disclosure. A VDP is just the disclosure program. So having like a security at email address or uh, the security.txt file, uh, having a way for researchers to reach out and disclose vulnerabilities to you uh, in a safe way, in a way that they're not going to be uh, charged with a crime for doing so. That's what the VDP is. Okay. Uh, so that that's a little bit different. A bounty is separate from that. And yes, every company, not just mature companies, should have a VDP. Yeah. Um, and yeah, some people do have questions about the bounties. We'll be getting to that later on in this topic. But I guess why don't we just start off going through an order here. One of the first things that comes up, um, our first issues really raised, comes down to the safe harbor and NDA. So like I just mentioned, reporting a vulnerability, you kind of end up in a case where if you report the issue, they can then say, well, that was unauthorized access. We're going to charge you. You know, you're going to be prosecuted for that crime, even though you're trying to do the right thing by reporting the vulnerability. And this has definitely happened. And I think I've talked about my views on disclosure a lot over the last few episodes. And I think a big part of kind of my wariness and like always deferring to what the company wants comes down to kind of having had my start in the days where people definitely were being arrested. They weren't operating in the most 
legitimate manner, you know, testing for SQL injection on every website you visit type thing. But, you know, they'd report that and then get charged with the crime for it. Uh, their their testing definitely wasn't wasn't in line with what would be considered responsible. Uh, I'll be fair to admit that. But at the time, basically, there was no option. Uh, now you can run VMs. You can do a lot without needing to actually test on somebody running a real server. There's a lot you can do, but... You know, stupid teenagers in the late 90s, early 2000s. It was definitely a lot harder to do that. Um, and at that time, people would test and report and end up charged with crime. So I think that's kind of where some of my views on just letting the company do whatever comes in. So now jumping back to this, safe harbor. Safe harbor is just that. You won't be charged with the crime. What's happening with bug crowd uh, hacker one with private bounties is that you'll basically be told sign this NDA you'll be added to the private bounty and then you can report your vulnerability so you can talk about the issue before you can disclose or they basically set a gag order on you where you can't talk about your issue if you want to disclose it to them or if you want to do the responsible thing and, yeah, basically trying to punish people for, for going the right way. Well, it. so here's the other thing, though, and it is worth noting, like, most vulnerability assessments have an NDA. You know, real-world assessments, when you're working for a company that's been hired to do an assessment, you have an NDA. I can't, you know, talk to you about all the vulnerabilities I've found in whatever clients I've had. You know, there's an NDA there. Like, that is a pretty standard process. It's just like you don't want to effectively humiliate your client. But uh, I think so, that's so part it, of what's it is different with these. Well. well, so again, that kind of comes down. I definitely. There are cases where. I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to think here if I can come up with a good example where perhaps it would be a good idea not to publicly disclose or at least not and when we talk about publicly disclose generally where i'm assuming i'm assuming things have been patched and have had people have had time to update and in that case like no as i did say earlier actually i do think all vulnerabilities should eventually become public so there's no case where they shouldn't at the same time when a company is hiring you know a pen testing firm any finding is going to be damaging to their reputation, no matter what. So I, I can understand the company not wanting to expose that, not wanting to be, yeah, we had these vulnerabilities and thus they're hiring researchers to do it. At the same time, I mean, yeah, I would like to see those public, but I, I get why a company wouldn't want that out there, especially if it's pre-release products. So I know for me, a lot of times we'd be brought on kind of during the standard release cycle. So it's like we are about to release this, get the security testing on it just before it actually gets released. So then those vulnerabilities never even would have made it to the public at all. And I think I can at least understand if it's part of your kind of secure development life cycle, not publicly disclosing those vulnerabilities. I think uh, part of the reason that, like, the non-disclosure, like, security researchers take an issue with the NDA is they'll basically use it on researchers who submit issues so that they can't talk about the issue publicly. And like you said, they can't damage the company's reputation. Well, so and that's also... a little bit different. An external researcher versus being hired by the company to do it. Okay. But I was making the point, like... talking about external researchers. Th this is. I was making the point that most assessments, though, do happen under an NDA. Most okay, assessments yeah, aren't that. Well, I don't actually know the numbers to compare, like, literally, like, are most requests generated by bounty hunters or by hired con hired consultants or whatever. But generally speaking, there are a lot of assessments that do happen under an NDA that are just, they're hired to do it. It's not under some sort of public bug bounty. That said, there's a trade-off when it comes to public bug bounties. And I'm going to and I'm going to say like I don't agree with having an NDA to report a vulnerability. Uh, in general, I mean, I 
I think more ND like a timed NDA where it's like you can talk about this until it's patched or until we reject the issue or something. I think that's fair. Uh, like you know, you can't report this bound or can't report this bug to us and then just start talking about it immediately. Give them time to fix it. You know, basically force coordinated disclosure. Mm -hmm. uh, would you disagree with that or kind of agree? I, I think that's fair, but I think what the researchers are arguing is they're basically saying, uh, you know, once you report an issue to them, you can never talk about it. And so, what yeah, and I, I wouldn't agree with that. I'm saying, like, as long as there is a, a timeline for disclosure. Oh, yeah, exactly. But that's what they're arguing is that, um, you know, they try. So, oh, yeah, they're what arguing kind of that to, you can't. That... What it kind of harkens back to is issues that were reported last year by uh, Jonathan Lesucci. I, I, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and it actually relates a little bit to Zoom. Uh, it was issues found in the Zoom client. So we tried contacting them to get the bugs fixed. And he offered them, uh, you know, the standard 90 day disclosure deadline to ship a patch. And then, uh, you know, after that 90 day deadline, he would disclose it to the public. And they kind of they didn't want that. Um, they wanted him to accept the bounty and sign an NDA that would have for forbade him from, you know, publicly disclosing the issue. And I think the reason that researchers are wary of that is they're worried that they're basically just going to buy the silence of the researcher and then they're not going to fix the issue or they're not going to take the issue seriously and fix it like way down the line after it could have been abused by you know malicious actors during that time period so i think that's why there's like more of a stigma around bug bounties by some of these researchers is this like you're buying my silence and not actually fixing the issue yeah and i'm actually going to say like this is something that I think Hacker One is in a really good place to change. Uh, you know, if if they, so I again, uh, get you get there in steps, getting to that full, complete transparency all the time. You get there in steps. So what I could see is like having a plan. You know, a company signs up with Hacker One uh, because Hacker One does offer a lot of benefits to the company in terms of having the bug triage, having some of that, so they're not getting all the garbage reports. And then they get a little bit of attention if you offer a bit of money. There's and Hacker One just makes it easy for the companies. So Hacker One's in a good place though to also start pushing those companies towards a better model for their disclosures. And Hacker One doesn't do this, but I think something Hacker One could do is a company signs up with them, okay, you don't need to disclose anything in your first year with us, but in your second year. You know, you need to be disclosing, you know, all of your critical vulnerabilities. Um, or, you know, in, in your second year, maybe maybe they'll go the other way. Like, But having some sort of step-by-step -step process where over time, they're going to increase the amount of disclosures they have and working them up towards that. I think that's something Hacker One could do. They don't do it. Uh, but given the position that they're in, I, they could easily leverage their position to uh, to do something like that, which I think would push security forward in general. Uh, I don't just want to say, well, bounties are all bad because some companies abuse this NDA aspect. No, you don't want to tar like tar it all with the same brush. Um, but I think like the, you know they're arguing that perhaps a better system should come along. But that being said, I don't know what that system would look like. You know well, what I mean? Oh, no. I think what I just suggested would be at least a fair way to go about it, requiring companies to slowly start disclosing more and more, uh, yeah. leading them up in that maturity process. Yeah. Now, one thing I did want to touch on is uh, one of the more interesting points, I guess, of the article. And take keep this in mind like anybody listening like neither of us are lawyers so this is going to be you know if there's any lawyers listening they may be like these guys have no clue what they're talking about but anyway um they talk about the legal implications of bug bounties in california and with the eu with gdpr now i think the the california one's kind of silly it's basically arguing on minimum wage and i, I think the argument is just dumb yeah but well so here's the thing and i i just kind of feel like bug bounties they kind of relate it to being like an Uber driver or something like that, that gig economy. And bug bounties are less like that and more like a contest, the skill-based contest. Yeah. yeah um, where you're finding bugs, something that requires skill, and you're getting rewarded for doing so. It's a contest. At you're least I would employee. argue it's a contest. <laughs> and I yeah, think not, that makes a difference. You're not an employee. You shouldn't be getting paid a minimum wage for bug hunting like they're kind of suggesting there. Um, I think the more interesting one, though, was the GDPR point. 
And I think what they were trying to argue there was like, um, users have the right to know if there's a potential breach um, due to issues that are found. And that should therefore mean that those issues should always be publicly disclosed after they're fixed. So I was kind of curious on what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, so a lot of bounties though will include information or will include terms about, and I mean, with all that we're saying, you know, we're not saying that companies should just allow all testing to happen. There are still limits on what you can do with your testing. So one of those terms that generally gets set has to do with not trying to access or being careful about the type of data that you do access. You, you're not allowed to, you know, get on a bug bounty program and just uh, you know, try and dump the entire database. Okay, you, when you do when you do that testing, you'll usually create or at least when, when I do testing, I'll create two accounts for every privilege level uh, at a minimum, perhaps more. It depends on the application. So generally, like you're trying to access another user's account. So you access your own accounts, like another account that you own rather than just random client data. And I believe that at least kind of helps when it comes to the GDPR, because you still shouldn't be exposing actual client information. You shouldn't be pulling down actual, you know, credit card information or something like that. Um, that said, as Specter was saying, I'm not a lawyer, perhaps with GDPR, that doesn't matter. And just if you have a vulnerability that could have been used to breach this data, that's all that's needed. Uh, that said, I would agree though with the statement that if a bounty hunter does pull out personally identifying information, does pull any sort of that information out, that should be, you know, that, that is a data breach. You know, bounty hunters are not part of the company and shouldn't count as part of the company in that sense. Uh, so I largely agree with what they stated there. Whether or not, the, regardless of the legal sense, like I largely agree that it should be counted as a breach if a bounty hunter actually pulls down that sensitive information, intentionally or not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see GDPR come into bounties a little bit more just because um, I think GDPR was like intentionally left very vague. So yeah. it could absolutely be brought into like this area and be applied if, if I mean, it's, it's to. responsible testing. As a yeah. researcher, you should not be trying to pull down the entire database. Uh, you should not be trying to just pull all the information you can. Um, I think we kind of talked about, you know, researchers behaving kind of badly in it some time ago. I don't remember what the report was, but I, I'm sure yeah, it's it come up before. Area. Yeah, no, we talked about it um, when there was a guy who was trying to report an issue through Twitter, and then he basically just, like, traversed the network and went right. deeper and deeper. Right, yeah. I forget what episode exactly, but it was fairly recent. It was in the last uh, couple weeks, I want to say. Yeah, well, no, I think it was longer than that, but because what, what was that... Was it some sort of? It was like clothing or something. It was actually it was directly in the title, so you could find it pretty easily because it was uh, the title was a dark white hat hacker or something like that. So our our episode yeah episode eighteen. There. Oh wow! Whoa, that long ago? Uh, well, I'm opening my notes to double check. Uh, no, it was episode thirty. Okay. Yeah. It, so there we go. That I thought that's just the first so episode that came up uh but yeah it's this is one of those things where as a researcher you still need to respect you know because it is live client data when you're testing on a lot of these bounties you're testing on the live websites live applications sometimes you are testing on test environments they do provide test environments so that's a little bit different too but you do have to be careful with your issues you know you don't they generally don't allow you to test denial of service issues you're not allowed to bring down production just because you're a white hat. Or so you claim. Yeah. So I think we can move into some exploits. Um, continuing our Zoom feast into the exploit section of the show, we have one here related to UNC paths and how those links are rendered to be clickable, which can allow people to steal NTLM hashes. So for those who don't know what UNC paths are, it, they're based, universal naming convention is what it stands for. And it can be used to access network resources and whatnot. Uh, it's used by Windows. Yeah, basically you've seen this when you see the double backslash followed by like a server host name or an IP or something. Yeah. Those are UNC paths. So generally speaking- I use it for my NAS, for example. Yeah, so w when you try and access one of those URLs on Windows, it'll send, 
your credentials to that endpoint. So in Zoom, when you send such a link, it'll create, or when you send such a UNC, it'll turn that into a link. You can just click and then Windows will do its default thing, try and open it, and it'll send your NTLM hash over to the target server. That That's the issue. It's kind of an issue with Windows just sending your authentication by default, although it, it is kind of a sane move to send creden credentials. Oh, you can turn it off by default. I'd recommend doing that, and then you just have to manually basically get it to send, uh, which I, I think would be a more sane default, but I kind of understand the history here. So Zoom makes them clickable. They're calling this a... Actually, I saw this talked about quite a bit. Um... I, I mean, this was blown way out of proportion. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was wanting to find a way to say is the gist of this is don't click random links, especially not random links that are UNC paths. Uh, I was actually yeah. I was on a Discord where in, in the staff chat they actually asked like, "Do we want to you know add everybody about this because it's such a huge issue?" And so I'm just like, one, they don't normally alert people about issues at all. Two. Don't click links. Like, this isn't that big of an issue. And don't get me wrong. Uh, and actually, I will say, like, for Zoom doing it, like, Zoom's used in a lot of business contexts where you're going to have these sorts of links flowing around. It makes sense to make them clickable. Uh, I, I would put this more on, I think, Windows should maybe do a more sane default uh, by not sending them by default and just, you know, prompting for it or something. Like, I would put more fault on Windows just having this as the default rather than on Zoom making it a link. When I saw this issue, I pinned it as basically a glorified phishing attack. Um, while you could argue Zoom could try to mitigate the issue by not making UNC paths clickable, it's ultimately a user issue that people need to be made aware of. Uh, where, like you said, you shouldn't just be clicking random links, especially where, like, you know, UNC path links are going to look more suspicious than your typical link as well. Yeah, so it seems but I'm reasonable not... to expect people not to click on that. I don't really want to... <laughs> to be fair, I just don't trust users, like, just random non-technical users to get that. Like, in all fairness, I just don't. I agree with you. Like, and it's such a simple okay. issue to avoid. I just don't have enough faith in random non-technical users uh, to learn to recognize the UNC path and know, okay, don't click that. I mean, no what doubt if, they could, but I just don't have a lot of faith in that one. What I think would be reasonable is for UNC path links, perhaps they could add like a warning dialogue on clicking it saying, well, you that's know, what I'm saying. this Some... is exactly what it does. And do you still want to continue with it? You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, a lot of users are just going to click over that. What was that? A lot of users are just going to click over those sorts of warning. Like, oh, you're, it's the same thing as those external warnings. Like, oh, you're going to an external website. You know, like Discord doing its, you know, external links are spooky or whatever. It, That's true. Whatever that warning is. Like, people just click through those alerts if they get them too often. That's why I feel like it would be better off if Windows had some sort of prompt by default. Be like, hey, either you're sending this over the internet or even just over the net. Well, I, it's going to be over the network, but, you know, perhaps even trusting the local network. Or, you know, if you're on a VPN, it's going to appear local, at least. Uh, versus over the internet. Like, just sending it to these external hosts, it, it just doesn't... Well, as I said before, an insane default. Uh, but yeah, this issue, like, oh, this feels, like, kind of mentioned earlier about the cloud chasing. Yeah. That's what this feels like. Just yeah. kind of putting out there. Now, to be fair... NTLM hash is easily broken. So basically, they're getting your Windows password out of it, is the gist of kind of what's happening. That That is an issue. Like, the root of the issue is definitely a serious concern. I just don't think it's Zoom's real fault here. Yeah, I don't think they bear, like, a lot of the blame. I think they could try to help make they, they could it, do but... more, and I believe they've just disabled UNC hats now as being links. Yeah, fair enough. 
Which, I mean, fair response to it. I just, I, I agree with you when he said it's been overplayed. Yeah. So I, I think that is our last, uh, our, our last Zoom topic. Nope, but, we've uh, got one uh, more. Oh, oh no, yeah, you're right. Our next one is actually a Zoom topic. <laughs> uh, well, uh, two, so actually. Two vulnerabilities in this one. Yeah. Uh, this is two things. One is a local privilege escalation to root on... I think both of these, yeah, both of these are on OS X. So yeah, they're both Mac OS uh, based issues. Yeah, so both of these are LP to root and code injection that gives you access to the microphone and camera. Basically, they just discovered, and this was another one that I saw getting mentioned a lot, which it's, it's at least, I'd argue, one, it's more on Zoom's fault it's more it's more zoom's fault and maybe a little bit more useful in terms of actually doing something with it so the gist of the first one the local privilege escalation is that the zoom installer uses this lovely api authorized execute with privileges basically just a way to execute with enhanced privileges or execute as root the api itself is documented as being insecure shouldn't be used or I believe it's even deprecated on OS X, but it doesn't validate the binary. It doesn't make sure it's signed or anything like that. Uh, if the binary is read-only or can't be modified, or is otherwise protected, it's still kind of okay to use it. But, um, uh, but with that, it doesn't validate. So if somebody could change the binary, they're basically able to get root. Zoom, the binary it runs, is basically a bash script run with root. Uh, so during installation, that run with root file has a period of time where it isn't protected as the installer unpacks the package file into a temporary user writable location. So somebody could exploit that by waiting for that file to eventually exist and be created and replacing it with their own content. And then the installer will eventually end up running with root whatever they put into that shell file. Yeah. In terms so, of, go ahead. So I was just gonna say, uh, um, you are you were cutting out a bit for me there. So like, I apologize if I re reiterate over an issue or you already touched over. But um, part of what makes these issues a little bit more uh, impactful too is uh, it was actually discovered that the Mac OS installer would perform the install without you ever even clicking install um, because it abused pre-installation scripts. So on its own, that's shady, but you know not necessarily malicious in nature. But how it also gets that root uh, privilege to run the script that you're talking about that could potentially be hijacked is it'll prompt the user for root privileges if you're not in the admin group. Um, but it doesn't prompt for root privileges as itself. It says system needs your privilege to change. Uh, it's it's almost like intentionally misleading to make you think that the Mac uh, operating system needs your permission, not uh, Zoom itself. So there's some shady issues on top of it that kind of make it like even worse than it could have been as well. Uh, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, had, uh, well, I was just going to add, like actually trying to exploit this though is basically... You would need local access. Well, you need local access and you need a wait for that pre-installation to happen. Yeah. So you're not getting access to this. Like, it takes a lot of patience for malware to eventually get this. And with that, I mean, that definitely limits the usefulness of it. Uh, and the second one here, uh, in terms of it's code injection that gives you mic and camera access, it's effectively DLL injection on OS X. Uh, OS X does provide a hardened runtime library validation, which prevents prevents you from loading other, or only allows you to load Apple libraries or those that are signed by the same team ID as the application itself. Uh, you can disable that, which Zoom goes ahead and does. And therefore, anybody can inject their own library into the Zoom application and then get access to the camera and kind of get around some of the permission checks. Uh, again, that one's definitely, you know, on Zoom. Yeah. So I definitely wouldn't call this one clout chasing like the last issue that we covered. Um, no, but this, they this are feels very limited in impact. This feels a lot more. It, 
the impact's a bit limited, yeah, but these are legitimate issues on Zoom that really just shouldn't have been there to begin with. The yeah, UNC one, I could understand why they made it a link, especially if they didn't understand what clicking it does. Um, you know, it makes sense making that a link. This, doing all this weird stuff, it makes, like, you can't, you can't just explain it away as, well, they should have, or they didn't know any better. They should have known better. There's no these. devil's advocate for it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, like, okay. and their local privilege escalations, yeah, it requires local access, and it requires kind of waiting for the right event to happen. But that's, that's completely fair. It does get you root. Yeah, like, it's not like it's, you know... Yeah, I mean, like, malware some... often exists on systems for quite a while, so if this was just like, oh, we don't have any other, if it, like, scans a system looking for some vulnerability it could use, doesn't have anything else, it just kind of sits there waiting on this. Like, yeah. I, I think that's completely fair. So, like, th there's definitely an attack scenario with this that wouldn't be just prevented by the user being smart about what they do. Yeah. Uh, so, though that is our last Zoom issue, though we can that end is, that yeah. feast and... Yeah, we'll move away from Zoom. Uh, we have a ZDI blog post about a use after free in the VMware Workstation DHCP server, uh, which was submitted to them by an anonymous researcher last month. So unlike some of the ZDI stuff we've covered in the past, this isn't like a working backwards from uh, like a patch tip or anything like that. This is uh, an issue that was submitted to them. So... The article first does a bit of a dive into how the DHCP release message handler works. And the gist of it for understanding the issue is it will end up copying the data from one leash structure to another. Uh, so like source to a destination. And it, this leash structure contains various information like the client IP address, the hardware address, uh, and a unique identifier. Yeah, and just and, that's um, the supersede lease function, as you were saying, just copies from basically the old one to the new one. Um, yeah. But I think the name kind of mat matters there in terms of understanding what's happening, why it's copying the data. In theory, these are generally going to be close to the same leases, some different information. Yeah. So when they go to take this new lease to write it to an internal table, um, the supersede lease function does a string comparison between the UID fields of the source and destination lease objects. And if they match, it'll free it to uh so that you know so that the same identifier isn't duplicated um however if you send dhcp discover and dhcp release messages repeatedly um the uid sort fields of the source and destination lease will point to the same memory yeah location. Wh which feels like a weird issue to have like this feels like some sort of race condition that results yeah, that's what i was thinking too uh like they don't race. they're not clear they literally just say when those two messages like dhcp discover followed by the release messages repeatedly received this happens and it doesn't really go into why that happens but eventually do it does happen well yeah i mean i'd love to know but i guess if you're writing the exploit it doesn't really matter you That's just true. know if you spam it you get this to happen you know you don't need to dig into it so i get why it's not there i am just definitely curious on really how that that in particular happened yeah, because yeah, I don't know that too. that just feels like a really weird, a weird thing to have happen. A weird coincidence, yeah. Yeah, so, so probably some sort of race condition in there. Yeah, so of course, where you know both the source and destination UID fields point to the same memory location, the string compare will succeed, and the buffer will be freed. But because the destination lease still points to that location. You have a dangling pointer, and that leads to use after free. So the patch for it was uh, very simple. Uh, VMware just added a check to make sure the source and destination UID field didn't point to the same location before calling the free. So very simple patch. Um, the article didn't go into detail of how to exploit this to perform uh, the VM escape. They mostly you know, left that as an exercise to the reader, which I think that gives a neat uh, opportunity to anyone interested in VM exploitation. If you're interested in that, I'd recommend giving this write-up a read and perhaps trying to exploit the bug yourself. Uh, I think it's a really good candidate to get your feet wet with because often there's not a lot of info out there about VM bugs, and this post gives you detail and sort of a root cause analysis. But leaves enough for you to work through the rest to kind exactly. of get it's to grok the point. issue, and yeah, it's it's a starting point for you to do an actual exploit. Which is ultimately like you, you can go and learn all the different techniques you want. 
it's doing things like this, actually writing up a real exploit. Even if you start off with this information, that doesn't take away from actually turning this into a weaponized exploit. And that's how you learn it, is by doing it. You can learn all the techniques, yeah. but once you've done that, you just need to get the practice actually doing it. Yeah. Taking a question from chat, uh, from Cat3009, uh, could it turn out to be unexploitable? Honestly, I doubt it. Um, something as complex as uh, a hypervisor uh, or like, you know, a, a virtual machine, a uh, use after free is an extremely powerful bug type. And especially, you know, it's the VM's not going to be using CFI or anything like that. So I think use after free is almost certainly going to be exploitable. The only thing that could end up being an issue is if the object you're freeing, if you can't get a good spray on wherever that is on the heap, uh, like if it's in a heap cache that you can't get a good degree of control over, that might make it unexploitable. But for the most part, use after freeze and complex software are like, uh, you know, they're almost always exploitable. So it, it, it probably is. Yeah, well, so if on I that guess. note, what, what do we have? Like the object being freed is that UID. So that's just the string that's going to be used after free. So it is going to kind of come down to how is that being used once you're able to obtain some control over its value. Yeah, you'd probably need to use it to create like, uh, you know, propagate some bugs later on down the line that are more powerful to exploit. But yeah, I'm just like, I'm just trying to imagine what your bug would be from controlling the UID. Like it's going yeah, to use to that. Uh, probably to track, probably doing some lookup based on it at some point. Uh, that's true, actually. That, that that's a good point. Maybe it's not as exploitable as I initially thought it. Yeah, like would it's be. not a complex object here, so I it, it I think it's a good question. It could turn out to be unexploitable, uh, because obviously when you have like a really complicated object, there's a ton of places that you can abuse once you kind of are able to control that object, but. I, I don't know enough to say how this is getting used because it seems like it's just a simple string. More. So you'd have to look at somewhere that string itself is being used or perhaps that string is being modified somewhere and then the app, uh, whatever it gets reallocated as could be what you target. Uh, which maybe if you're able to control that value at some point. Uh, I just yeah. don't know where you'd be to modify UID because usually that's going to come up early and stay well static so i don't see that as being a big possibility so yeah it really comes down to where uid is being used yeah it's a fair point it might not be as exploitable as i originally thought um one avenue you might be able to take is if like there's a stir len call on it though i think that's unlikely because they do have that uid len field too so they might not ever do stir len on that uh string so you have to look more at the subsystem, I guess, to see how exploitable it is. And that's a fair point. Like, maybe the the reason they didn't go into further detail is maybe it isn't exploitable. Although, actually... Um, Although, wouldn't ZDI mostly be buying bugs? Yes, and actually, I was just thinking, they have this ZDI advisory uh, link in the actual blog post. Yeah, and they I have was, a CVSS score there as well. So, I was just looking at that, actually. Yeah, it does say privilege escalation... Although there's multiple CBEs in there as well, so... Well, so two of them, they said, were lesser uh, issues. Um, so what did they say here? Oh, they actually gave it a 9.3. They said successful exploitation may lead to code execution on the yeah. host. So yeah, it is it is possible, according to the, uh, the CBE, so... Yeah, well, so the CV, though... <laughs> They don't necessarily actually prove that. It's just, okay, this is a type of issue that can, so we're going to rate it as this. Um, and obviously, may allow denial of service condition, which... But I think with CDI, course. the CDAEs are often accurate with how impactful they are. At least from, like, the past. Well, you know, so past aren't there I've ZDI seen. advisories? Like, a separate ZDI dash thing that we could have expected for this issue? Yeah, that's what I was looking at, okay. and it says oh, I was in it. I was looking yes. at the VMware one. I, I oh, do yeah. see the other one here. I see a 7.8 for it, though, uh, um, on the VMware reporting. 
Oh yeah, so the CVE has a different CVSS than the uh, ZDI thing, so that's kind of interesting. But they do say an attacker can leverage his vulnerability to escalate priv privileges and execute code in the context of the hypervisor. So yeah, like my yeah. understanding of what ZDI would be doing is they would generally be buying it if it were an actual issue, like if it were exploitable. Like at least to doing that, whether like you wouldn't need to provide a ASLR bypass or anything like that. But you would, at least my understanding was, you would need to at least provide, like, enough showing it's a, you know, enough to do a proof of concept, EIP or RIP control. Yeah, something like that. So, I, I'd argue that there probably is some way to abuse that. Um, yeah, good question. Spawned a, good, a long, longer discussion than I'd have expected. Yeah. Yeah, we'll leave that. Uh, we'll leave that as an exercise to so anybody who wants to try to exploit that. Yeah, um, if you answer that question, you know we can't do it, but or we can't answer it for you. But just spend all the time you want on it, all those hours, and let us know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll move on. So unlike this article, um, our next one does focus on exploiting a known bug, um, and this this next post focuses on exploiting the SMB v3 vulnerability that was patched by Microsoft last month. Uh, the named vulnerability SMB Ghost. So there were some POCs out that, for this bug before, but all of them were, they were basically just denial of service POCs, nothing for getting code execution. Uh, though the advisory said the code execution was possible because they labeled it as, as an RCE. So this post explores how they actually exploited it to get code execution and not just a DOS. Um, so first they, they detail the specifics of the bug, or rather I should say bugs, because there's multiple cascading integer overflows in this code. Um, so for those who are watching, uh, we can bring up the code on the screen here and you can cause overflows on two different fields in here that can cause, uh, like propagate issues further down the line. Uh, one of them is on the offset field and the other one is on the original compressed segment size field. And, uh, after these guys played with different combinations of overflows for these two fields, they found the most promising combination was to use a reasonable offset value but a very large original compressed segment size value. And what would happen here is due to the integer overflow with the addition statement, the allocation would end up being smaller than yeah, the sum so of the fields. I do want to interrupt you really quickly and just kind yeah, of mention go what's going on with this. Uh, so you get the SMB packet that comes in and it contains the raw data. And obviously as most, most protocols do, it includes a header. Um, in that header, you, your actual data, the raw data, may be compressed, it may not be, or maybe it is always compressed. Because uh, this, sorry, this function in particular is dealing with stuff that's always compressed. It's decompressing the data. So it'll take that raw data, um, it'll allocate a new buffer, uh, and then it will take the compressed data, it'll decompress it into that buffer, and then it will prepend uh, the raw data, any data that was in there that wasn't compressed. Uh, so that's where the header offset is basically saying like all the data before this offset, that's just, uh, it's basically, it's providing the offset into the data block to where the compressed data starts. So all the information before that offset just gets mem copied right into the buffer, uh, to the start of the buffer. Um, and the compressed data is decompressed into the new buffer starting at that offset. Uh, so just to kind of explain something values there, like the offset is how far into the data block the data, the compressed data is. The original compressed data size value or field is, of course, the original compressed data size or segment size, uh, which I think is self-explanatory. Uh, and obviously you can control yeah. both of those in the header. Uh, so deciding all the proof of concepts just gave it, you know, zero X, uh, FFFF, so minus one, which of course are like the biggest value possible or minus one if it's signed, uh, effectively overflowing the integer, causing a crash when it would try and access this memory eventually or try and write to memory there. Uh, sir, you can go on though with your explanation. Yeah. So like you were saying, the POCs that were out there were just a DOS because they used a very large, uh, you know, value. We would write way out of bounds of the buffer. Uh, but they ended up, you know, controlling it more because you do have quite a degree of control over that value. And they found that they could actually smash the header that you were just talking about of the packet um, on the heap. 
And so they were originally going to try to trigger a use after free because there's a piece of code in the uh, snippet that was on screen that would trigger a free on a certain condition. And they were going to try to force that condition with memory corruption. But when they tried it, they accidentally ended up finding a far better route to exploit this. And they basically found that the decompress function that gets called um, updates the final compressed size value to the compressed buffer size. So the mem copy uh, down below is hit. And then they can actually control what buffer is used for that mem copy for the sort or for the destination. So they can basically get an arbitrary write through the mem copy. So you know, yeah. That got so the I do want to add in a little bit of data there, uh, yeah. or a little bit that I think you kind of skipped over. Okay. Uh, so when they have the user buffer, uh, obviously there's that target buffer that's been allocated. Uh, they kind of control the ultimate size of that, as we've mentioned, because they control you know the size of the data that's going to be dealing. So they know what the size is going to be. Uh, so what they're able to do is they control that in such a way that the uh, it can be allocated in several different locations. Uh, and they talk about this a little bit um, as I believe there is a pool for it and there's a look aside list for some. It, it all comes down to the different sizes. Uh, Larger, so large applicate or sorry, large allocations will just fail. Anything larger than sixteen megabytes, uh, medium allocations larger than one megabyte, less than sixteen, will use this buffer pool, and smaller ones less than a meg will use the look aside list. The look aside list that they implement here includes meta information in line uh, with the heap data. So they show it on screen here you end up having the user buffer that gets returned. It returns this object that includes a pointer to the actual user buffer. And following that buffer, at the end of the buffer, is an allocation header structure that includes, that is kind of the object that gets returned. Uh, so it returns that allocation header, and that includes a pointer over to the user buffer rather than just returning that user buffer. So it's not it's not working quite like malloc. Um, if you're just expecting it to return a block of memory, it returns an object that. Um, sorry, I was it, distracted by the comment in chat, which I definitely want to deal with after I keep talking about this. Uh, but anyway, so the allocation header struct is where they get, if I come back up here, is where they get the user buffer address for. So you control the decompressed data, or sorry, you control the raw data in the packet that's going to be copied to that location. And because of the overflow that you can get with the decompression, uh, when it's decompressing the data, you control what that pointer ends up pointing to. Uh, so you yeah. control the data that's going to write, and you control because of overflowing that metadata in the heat in the heap that they create. Um, you control the address. Uh, so I just wanted to cover that little detail. That's they're overwriting an address in kind of like the heap metadata, not in the protocol header. Yeah. So, you know, when you have arbitrary write in the kernel, uh, it's basically game over. Uh, that's a very, like, it's stupidly powerful primitive. Um, and they ended up using an old trick published in 2012, which is basically uh, leaking the address of the current process token with NT query system information. And then you just write your own token in there to uh, privilege escalate. So uh, I know we do want to address the uh, comment from chat with, uh, but they only got LPE, not RCE. I think that that might be like a a misnaming on their part because i this should be able to be rce -able. Well, so this the dhcp server uh that's being used here this is the vm's dhcp server it's not not necessarily hitting out on the network uh what this is, is it's what all the vms are going to be using so it's a guest to host escape uh it's what the vms are able to communicate with to get like their internal ip address and like kind of on the internal uh, VM'd network. Uh, so I think that's why it's being listed more as a privilege escalation rather than RC, because this isn't something that you're hitting just somebody out on the random network. Is At least not necessarily. You probably can't expose it to do so, but I don't imagine that's the default. And thus they'd list it as more as LP rather than RC. Uh, when you were talking about the VM, like the DHCP, are you, sh are you conflating with the last issue? Because I don't see any 
I didn't see any mention of like DHCP or anything in this. Oh, article. sorry. I thought he was talking. I thought he was making that response uh, to our ZDI one, not to this bug. No, I think it's related to um, this bug because sorry. they originally say at the top that um, you know the advisory said that this was an RCE or it could be RCE'd, but their title they have uh, exploiting it for local privilege escalation. So that's uh, why I think there was a okay, bit of a confusion yeah. there. I'm sorry. I thought that was still a follow up with the. With the last topic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, actually. I, I think uh, it's just like a misnaming on their part. I think they... Because like, like I was saying, like this issue should absolutely be able to be hit remotely. So I don't... I think it should be a remote privilege escalation, not a local privilege yeah, escalation. Yeah, maybe they're only making it... Or maybe they're only mentioning as local privilege because they are... Uh, well, I was going to say because they're just doing this LPE trick. Uh... Yeah, I'm not sure, actually. That's a good point. You know what? It may actually be because of the route they took. So the arbitrary right getting to that point is probably hittable remotely. But I think the trick they used that I mentioned with getting the current process token with NT query system information, that's something that you need local access to be able to do. So I think well, that's Well, but you're getting it from the exploit. You're, are, well... No, well, no, I guess it's a, yeah, 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 I see what you mean. Right, so you wouldn't be able to arbitrary right in kernel too. Token. Yeah, it, it's not yeah. a user. It's I, I was initially thinking, okay, so RC, and then they use that to escalate. But yeah, yeah. So I think that's what it is. It could be hit remotely, but they hit it locally because of the trick they use. But arbitrary kernel right is honestly such a powerful primitive that there is no doubt a way that you could do it remotely. It's probably just a bit harder, but it's probably it's probably doable. So. Yeah, they, their specific exploit was LPE, but it could be turned into an RCE, I think. So, yeah, I think, that, I think that's what's happening there. Uh, that being said, I, I don't think I have much more to add on that. I think we can move on to uh, exploiting parser differentials in GitLab. So, our next issue is directly in GitLab, uh, and it's from their file upload functionality, it seems. And it's kind of a cool attack, because it's similar to the HTTP desync attacks we've covered in the past. Um, because the issue is a discrepancy between how two of their servers, GitLab Workhorse and GitLab Rails, interpret um, HTTP requests. Yeah, I mean, so, they both definitely kind of follow from that same basic idea, as it mentions there, a, uh, actually, well, a different parser differentials, where one processes something differently than the other. Uh, like, it follows from the same thing. The attack's pretty different, but conceptually, like, it comes from that same sort of all oh, the desync between them Same or the differentials. Yeah. Yeah. So what it seems is when you upload a file, it first goes through the workhorse, which has roots defined for different HTTP methods. Yeah, such workhorse as is their files. reverse proxy. Yeah. So when this request is received, the workhorse uploads the file onto the disk and tells GitLab Rails, uh, which is their back end, where the file is placed. And this is all managed internally, so it's not like a user can define any path of where that file is written to on the disk. Uh, you know, it's managed by um, GitLab Workhorse. So the Workhorse takes that request, uploads the file, and then it rewrites the request and passes it off to GitLab Rails with the uh, proper path. Now, normally, it wouldn't be possible to control any of the put request from Workhorse to Rails, as that's all handled internally. But there's an issue due to the method override functionality. Well, so I think should also mention here is that Workhorse is, as it's a reverse proxy, it handles some requests. Some of them get, do get modified by Workhorse. So this example of all the pull requests to uh, the API packages slash Conan and whatever path following that, uh, all of those end up getting dealt with or getting modified by workhorse and then kind of turn into another request that hits the main rails application or the main rails api uh but if you unmatch routes end up just being passed on uh unmodified to rails I, yeah that's kind of an important detail here where the desync happens is workhorse has no knowledge of this method override Whereas Rails, by default, has this rack method override middleware that looks for underscore method as a parameter or xhttp method override as a header. And we've talked about issues with method overrides before. Yep, we have. Uh, it's definitely, it's a common method for, I 
I mentioned I was uh, dealing with fire web application firewalls that might not be aware of it. You know, kind of a similar deal here with the reverse proxy. It it's not aware of that, so it's seeing it's seeing you know probably a post request or something like that coming through. You're like, okay, I don't know how to handle this post request, so I'm not going to worry about it. Whereas this web server is like, oh hey, I got a put request because it's get it gets overridden. Uh, so you can kind of maybe start to see where this is going, where now, if you're able to override that request, sending some that doesn't get modified by workhorse, but is still treated as a put request in the Rails application, you might be able to get to start working with another file. Yeah, uh, any file. Well, not quite any file. So actually, um, the Rails application doesn't completely trust just what it gets it actually has a whitelist of acceptable paths and it also adds slash temp to that but they have a whitelist so even with that they still kind of protect the endpoint a bit they don't just trust workhorse to give it uh exactly what it needs uh, nonetheless basically you can still get it to work with basically any file that exists in slash temp or any other acceptable directory. So you would have to know some of those file names. You can make some guesses about what might end up in temp, uh, but you would have to know that to actually abuse this issue. But uh, it's, I mean, that's kind of the gist of it is you're able to make that direct request because it passes right through. Did they say if it was possible to do path traversal on that? Well, that's what I was saying. They validate the path. Yeah, uh, no, like I in, in the Rails the application, right. they validate what the path is. So if you escape out of that path, it's not going to it's no longer going to match the expected like allowed paths. OK, fair enough. Like okay. basically, so, was, so I'm, bit, uh, I guess they use file on real path and I'm not sure up front uh, if that will resolve like exactly how that resolves. So I'm going to imagine uh, that that should resolve any relative links or anything like that. Okay. Um, yes, it returns the absolute path name. Uh, so that's basically exactly how you should be validating file paths. Don't bother just checking, you know, uh, where basically resolve it to its absolute file name and then just check the start of it, make sure the path matches what you expect it to be. Don't try and do don't look for like dot dot slash or dots or try and remove that. Don't do anything fancy and weird. Just get the absolute path and see if it matches uh where you want it to be within. Um so anyway, yeah, so they they do that. Uh so basically they're checking that real path, so they get the absolute path, and then they compare it with the upload paths they allow and they also and the slash temp. Um if it's not in there, it gets rejected. Yeah. Uh, so you can't you can't get out of it. You need to. It's only files within temp or within the allowed path. Okay, fair enough. Um, so they obviously fixed the issue, and uh, how they fixed it is what they do now is they sign the request from Workhorse to Rails. So even if you try to do these kinds of sneaky requests using the method override, since you can't sign that request, um, it won't pass the validation and it won't be respected, and it'll, you know it just won't run. Yeah, I mean so. that feels like a bad solution to me. Um, so it's, it's a definitely working solution. Like there's no immediate way around that, but in order to implement that, because obviously some requests do need to pass through, I, I'm assuming that not every, the reason they even have that pass through to begin with is some requests just don't really need to be modified by, uh, the workhorse. Like they yeah. just need to be passed through. Uh, so it's not going to sign those requests, presumably. Um, it's only going to sign the ones that workhorse goes ahead and actually modifies or the things that actually need to pass through workhorse, which means on the rail side or somewhere, there needs to be either a whitelist of routes that can be processed without a signature or all the functions need to check that signature. Like there, there needs to be some way for it to know what methods are okay or not okay. Or, I see what you're saying. It's possible they could miss one. Yeah, well, that's the thing. When you, issue. 
that's exactly what I'm thinking is eventually somebody's just going to mistakenly miss some endpoint or something if they've implemented how I'm thinking. Maybe they've thought of something else that just didn't come to mind when I was reading that. But my initial thought was that there would need to be some list that gets maintained here. Uh, now, perhaps they could sign it with, like in the signature, um, like they can include some meta information that then allows it to know kind of the URL that it thinks workhorse signed. So then that could be done at a universal layer where it's just looking like, is the signature, like does the signature match the URL, like signing the URL basically. Uh, so then if it ends up being a different type of request, that it'll get caught there. So I could see some ways that's being done. It just feels like a weird solution to me. Yeah. Um, I, that said, I guess I could probably go find out what it's doing. I didn't think about this with GitLab. Um, at least some of it is open source, so. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think they even linked to like a GitHub uh, page or something that had some of their code on it, so. Really? I, I uh, like, I so. so uh, I'm saying really on the fact that GitLab linked to GitHub. Oh, sorry. Okay, no. I, I think they linked to, like, a source page on GitLab. Yeah, I shouldn't have said GitHub. <laughs> yeah, f fair enough. That, but that's what I was I, saying, really, too. Like, they exposed it over on GitHub or GitLab. Yeah, it's probably somewhere on uh, Git, GitLab. Yeah, I don't imagine uh, GitLab would be linking to GitHub. That'd be pretty stupid. <laughs> yeah, actually, all these routes and stuff are clickable, so... Yeah. I'm going to assume... I mean, I, I could dig into it... Uh, yeah, I think that's probably not going to do that here on stream though. But um, yeah, it's I don't know. It, it, it just feels like it just felt like a weird issue, or, or sorry, a weird solution to the issue. Um, weird solution for a weird said, issue. It's better than trying to just fix that differential alone, like because that just is like this big cat and mouse games or cat and yep. mouse game where. Oh, you find this differential, you fix that. Oh, well, there's this other thing that's different. And there's this other thing. And you just, you keep adding on. Things just keep being found that are different across them. So kind of wanted to show it off on the stream because it's a unique bug. And it's also in a system that a lot of people use for projects. Uh, GitLab yeah, well, isn't small by any means. And I mean, the whole underscore method is definitely, like, it's a common enough thing. That it's it's always worth being aware of that and seeing it being used in this way is yeah it's definitely an interesting attack. So our next article is one about getting access to the camera on iOS and macOS devices without getting permission from the user through a web R RTC bug. So I'll let Z cover this one as I didn't get a chance to look into yeah, it as so much less as I wanted web to. Yeah, so RTC and more. This is Safari in particular and dealing with how Safari tracks permissions. Uh, so one thing of note, this is actually, for what the bug is, it is a very long, long and yeah. drawn out explanation. It is the complete thought process of how we went from noticing one thing to noticing this fairly, I want to say convoluted attack method. It, it's a fair read, like I'm definitely not hating on it for that, but it's definitely a long read. Um... But, you know, as as an issue, like, it is interesting, like, why he looked at this rather than, like, if this just came out as, well, you do these things, it would be surprising anybody ever discovered it. Uh, but kind of explaining how he got there and through the entire process, it, it's, it was still interesting. It's not, like, my favorite to read. I did find it a bit dry and stuff, but that's also just probably partly because of the more like javascript and application layer versus the binary stuff which i prefer yeah the anyway, issue not really a low level issue yeah it's still still i mean it it exposes a lot of that thought process which i think is valuable to kind of see how you work your way to this fairly complex issue uh so starting off with something background with it uh on os x and ios basically you have you have the permissions uh, for like an application access the camera and needs to have permission to do so. Uh, the thing is, Apple applications actually get that for free. Uh, any Apple application is allowed to access the camera, is allowed to uh, basically has some, pro or sorry, the microphone's the other thing, is allowed to access that without actually needing to prompt for permission. So Safari being an Apple application gets that for free, but it tracks it itself 
in order to prompt you for um for like websites to request specific permission um so going from that that's kind of your background there yeah the that's kind of the security model around how you get access to the camera so what this walks through is first of all it starts looking at how does safari keep track of your websites how does it know what one website is how does it keep track of things for same origin policy and basically they noticed um and i'm not going to walk through the entire issue but i'm just going to point out more some highlights but they noticed in there that when they have like the websites listed uh they'd be on like a www dot uh and only example.com would show up so they kind of noticed just how you know it's probably parsing out for the host name and what they noticed eventually was that how it would parse the host name is it would ignore the protocol so they showed the example of going to fake colon slash slash example.com which would count as having example.com open uh so it ignored the protocol so what it did was it would just grab between the colon slash slash and the next slash to get the host name which kind of makes sense until you realize that there are some protocols that are supported or pseudo protocols like file slash slash or blob view source data things like that or javascript would be probably the more common one uh, that don't have a host in it but it will still load it that same way um then they kind of talk through how they start noticing some other issues like if you had a domain with a dash and a dot next to each other how it kind of bugs out but effectively they found for example that they could use a file where is it uh, they could use file, you know, Skype dot Skype.com and it would be loaded as though its origin was uh, Skype.com. Uh, was the one example that kind of would come up there. However, or sorry, uh, they would use uh, JavaScript to change location.host to be Skype.com uh, rather than actually doing it in the URL. Uh, that said, okay. uh, they talk about a number of different tricks that they end up using here. So they kind of worked out. So they're able to kind of get control of the origin file. While that kind of worked, uh, it doesn't support mobile. So they didn't actually go that route. They kind of end up deep diving into blobs. Uh, but what happens with blobs is they end up talking about these opaque origins. So what happens when a blob, if you're not familiar with a blob, blobs are... In JavaScript, you can go and do like a new blob and then give it basically a file that it's going to write and a meta or a MIME type for it. Uh, you can give it that information and then you can, it'll give you a UID that you can then load up as though it were an actual file or an actual URL. Uh, so it just kind of creates that kind of in memory uh, and you do that with JavaScript. So it, it's a little bit special. Uh, so what happens if uh, you know, how does it get the origin for blobs? Um, and it deep, it dives into that. Couldn't just, um, you can't just create a blob from Skype.com, for example. He kind of dives into it. Uh, what ends up happening eventually is he figures out that in some cases with the blob origins, you could end up with a empty origin rather than a null origin or an opaque origin, uh, which just doesn't quite serialize. It actually gets treated as empty where it thinks the origin is literally just colon slash slash. Uh, so what ends up happening when he's able to trick the origin to be colon slash slash, which he ends up only being able to do if you, in theory, or he discovered it by only manually typing in the URL not by getting it through any sort of automated means. Although he ends up using another trick to kind of get around that using push state uh, to effectively change what that origin ends up looking like. Uh, that ends up happening because you have the colon slash slash is what it thinks is the origin. Uh, so then when you use push state, it just if you set the push state to skype.com which is how you change the url without actually changing um it, it's used by javascript so ajax stuff um 
you'll change the URL without actually needing to make a full request to a new page. You can just change the URL kind of magically with JavaScript. Uh, that's what push state is, or part of push states. In particular, that's changing your history uh, versus replacing. Uh, I won't go down that path though, but because of because of finding that blank origin, the colon slash slash, when he sets the thing to skype.com, it thinks he's just setting a path, not changing the how the other area of Safari will actually uh, parse it as the domain being skype.com now. It thinks it's doing something else. So it sets the path to something like skype.com, something that has permission uh, to use the camera. Uh, so basically figure out how to programmatically create a document with any sort of spoofed origin. His next hurdle was getting around. So you can only open the camera. WebRTC needs to be encrypted. It needs to be over, in theory, that's supposed to be needs to be over HTTPS. In practice, files are one place where, so file colon slash slash are one place where you'll have uh Obviously, it's not an HTTPS request, but you can still open the camera. And that's because Safari will treat basically anything that has no origin, the file URIs, data URIs, as a secure context. And that's obviously there to help developers. That's why files kind of get treated as being a secure context, even though it's not necessarily secure, or at least not secure in the sense of being over HTTPS. <laughs> Discovers that discovers that you can easily create that sort of opaque origin using a pop-up from a sandboxed iframe. Uh, so if eventually, you know, using a pop-up from a sandbox iframe doesn't have any, or doesn't have, or has an opaque origin set, then everything I've said above can follow and it's able to basically get your camera access, which is the gist of this is any website can open and view your camera. That's a lot of work for a. It's for a very a deep bypass. thing, and I know I didn't do it justice, uh, just because trying to explain everything. But he he walks through it like if you read through this, you'll understand kind of all the details about it. Um, it doesn't. I know, like I said, I didn't give it a really good overview there. Um, its overview at the end here, the quick summary is open an evil HTTP website. HTTP website becomes a data URI, data URI becomes a blob URI, which the blob URI is that special one that happened to be blank rather than uh, just being considered opaque. Uh, manipulate the window history, had to do that in two parts because of the, because of how the thing would get parsed. About blank, like, yeah, about blank iframe, document right to that to create the sandboxed, <laughs> iframe then from there attempt an impossible navigation using X, like that x frame options would deny uh, and from within the frame window.open now are able to get your host to go into this other document that can execute javascript and open the camera and that's in a secure context sorry get camera access with these fifteen thousand easy steps <laughs> only nine steps and one of them is profit okay. according to this but, but uh, that's that my point is it is a really like complicated thing and <laughs> yeah. that's why i feel like it's actually it was worth bringing up here like again i'll say i apologize for not being able to really give that do justice to the summary but as a it's writer one of those things where it's better to read yeah it gets he walks through how we got to every, how we went through every part of the process how every step came because if we just talked about that like that's just like, you know, how do you realize that? You know, this write-up goes through. How do you realize that? Um, again, complicated, very roundabout. Like, it's not something that you're just going to one day decide to try. Like, what if I do this and this and this? But, yeah, I don't know. It, it's a good write-up for that. Like I said, I did feel it was a little bit on the drier side. But, I mean, if you're actually interested, it's, yeah, it, it's worth the read. It, it's got a lot there for you if you're interested in it, yeah. Um, we'll terms, move on to our, oh, sorry, were you going to add something? Well, there? I was just going to say, in terms of one that doesn't have a lot there for you, 
Uh, we've got a hacker one report from James Hancock. Uh, this is impacting Slack, I believe it was. Yeah, Slack relative path vulnerability resul results in arbitrary command execution slash privilege escalation. A $750 bounty for this. Uh, it's not on the uh, like Slack client. Uh, this uses Nebula, which is kind of this networking tool that Slack has. It used between components to create like this mutually authenticated peer-to-peer -peer software defined network is the language out of their GitHub repo for it. Uh, basically created to provide like a mechanism for various groups to host communicate securely across the internet. Um, so Nebula in particular, just so this issue is really simple. It uses a relative path when it does uh, execute.command it just uses ifconfig or route or on windows it uses netsh it doesn't give the full path or the absolute path like sbin ifconfig so what that means is if you can control the binaries in the path before it finds the original one you're able to get it to execute uh, as a privileged user whatever binary you want it to run uh, so Essentially, uh, when you call just for ifconfig, for, for example, uh, your system's going to look, okay, well, is IF, it's going to look at your path environment variable. It's going to get all the folders out of that. It's going to go in order. First folder in there is ifconfig in here. No? Okay. Second folder in there is ifconfig in there. No? Okay. Third folder? Okay. Here's ifconfig. Let's execute that. So an attacker who can place a binary of the same name somewhere in that path before the actual binary is found can get to be run. Uh, yeah. Straightforward issue. Just use absolute paths when you're going to execute something. Don't assume. Don't assume the setup. It does require obviously somebody that can that's in a position to place a binary, but uh, because and modify path as well. Yeah. Well, or place a binary within the path. Yeah. Uh, you you could modify path. That's the easiest way to do it. Just you know, put temp in the path or something, and then execute into temp. But it just needs to be in the path somewhere. Uh, so like the user doesn't need to be able to do that. They just need to be able to get a file. Though odds are, if you're able to get a file wherever you want with whatever name you want, you probably can also mess at least somewhat with the environment variables. Yeah. Although that actually ends up being a point of issue that they actually have with reproducing this. Um, though you can go ahead and just read that. They had a little, or the uh, triage team had a little bit of issue actually proving this was an issue just using sudo because sudo would use its own path information. It wouldn't, wouldn't use the executing users, but uh, the difference being here that it's executing already as privilege and just executing it um either way you can read about that discussion i didn't think it was too interesting i just thought it was worth bringing up yeah you know, this is definitely one of those common issues and it's really easy not to make use an absolute path it's a little bit less portable but it's better basically um happens on a lot of applications straightforward yeah i mean i was a bit surprised considering like the impact is limited because you do need that level of access to pull it off but it is it a gets privilege you, escalation yeah. because nebula runs as root um but i was a bit surprised that the bounty was as high as it was 750 dollars. obviously that's cool for the researcher but it's a bit higher than i was expecting i guess i don't um, know i mean that that seems pretty fair for privilege escalation i mean you are getting root out of it on all the yeah. client on all slacks clients that are actually using uh nebula yeah that being said the severity was taken down i think initially it was high uh but before disclosure they knocked it down a bit because of the level of access required to pull yeah. it off um so we'll get into some research uh it's been a few episodes since we've had a paper so we're going to cover a paper that talks about our favorite types of papers which is uh, adversarial attacks uh against uh LIDAR, or Light Detection and Ranging Detectors, for self-driving vehicles. We love we love self-driving vehicles on Day Zero, so... <laughs> yeah, well, so I like talking about uh, these issues that can really happen, uh, yeah. basically. Yeah, this and, is definitely more of a real-world type attack. And just to be fair, uh, we have had... We did have a paper, uh, I want to say, like, two episodes ago, maybe. So it hasn't been that long since we have 
haven't had paper but uh anyway with this one it's they call it a physically realizable adversarial examples for lidar object detection it is not um they don't actually realize it physically this they just they do all of this digitally to see how it would detect something they don't actually pull this off, which is unfortunate, but I do like talking about the ones that could be done in the real world. It's not, it doesn't require access to the imaging system. As yeah, example. it doesn't require access to the CAN bus or anything like that. Well, I um, just meant like, uh, you know, sometimes the attacks will assume when they're working against the camera in particular, you know, they'll assume they can just modify all the pictures exactly and like make minor pixel perfect modifications. This doesn't. This assumes you could put effectively that you could put something on your roof and it will no longer detect you as a car. Yeah. Uh, which, which is the gist of this thing. What they noticed was that a lot of training data doesn't include objects on roofs of cars. Which, you know, absolutely happens in the real world. Just not so much. Like, it, it's a little bit uncommon so I can understand that uncommonness being translated to training data where it's just not really there. Uh, so what they do yeah. is they digitally manipulate what the point cloud would have looked like and see how it gets detected. Um, and I will jump uh, pretty much right to the results unless you have something to say about it, Spectre. I just wanted to say um, this this like idea of investigating this route of attacking um, object detection doesn't seem to be new. Uh, they do point out to some previous work that was done on it, though they point out that a lot of that previous work was theoretical. Um, the attack was using adversarial point clouds like you were talking about, um, but that mesh was only being considered for like a few specific frames, uh, not like universally for like any scene, and the data set was also like very small. So what they're doing isn't entirely like new, it has been looked into before, but it seems to be um, like more universally applicable than some of the other papers that have covered it. Uh, but yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, and I, I have to imagine like... A lot of these systems are, like, they don't have the model that Tesla uses, for example. They are basing this just off of a more generically trained model. Uh, and so it is worth pointing out, like, just because they find these issues doesn't mean it's like, oh, well, the next Tesla you buy is necessarily going to do the same thing. Um, so, yeah, worth, worth mentioning that. But getting just right down to it, basically, they just mocked up different objects that could be on your roof um and well they started by just mocking them up uh to see what it would get classified as and it actually did a reasonable job at detecting the vehicle despite the fact that there's also a couch on the roof or a canoe on the roof which I, you could expect reasonably that i don't know about a couch but a canoe, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was going to, sorry, I was going to say you could expect reasonably that it should be able to handle. Not that you could necessarily expect to see it. Um, <laughs> just that it should be able to kind of handle that. So then with a little bit of adversarial changes on, it's still things that you could do. But it looks like, you know, the canoe was a little bit malformed or whatever. Um, they found a much greater degree of success, like with their adversarial couch, the car would be detected as a <laughs> couch 68% of the time. So that there you are, just, just going down the freeway in your cabinet 54.1% uh, <laughs> of the time. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a straightforward attack here. It's similar to other things we've talked about. I just love the idea of, you know, your self-driving car thinking the thing next to you was a cabinet and not a car. I think it's kind of neat because a lot of the adversarial attacks we cover are done intentionally. But this is kind of showing you could do it intentionally, but it's also possible that just very benign things that people do, like putting a canoe on top of their car, which I see all the time in the summer, could uh, end up fooling these systems. Well, Something, you know, it's not necessarily intended to fool those detectors, but it could end up doing that. Yeah, it could. Uh, obviously, the results of that were less, like the canoe in particular was 26.9%. But it's still the there. Canoe, but the adversarial one was definitely a lot higher. But yeah, it's still there. Yeah. And the adversarial ones, um, 
uh, they are kind of like they are maybe possible um it probably wouldn't physically work out if you tried to do it and uh you'd probably get pulled over for an unsafe load with some of these images they have here <laughs> but um you know it just it's kind of interesting because like you said a lot of the ones we've covered have dealt with like 2d modifications like direct pixel modifications or putting something over stop signs or something like that it doesn't really deal with i do um, like the stop sign ones actually oh i like like i mean saying this one's different from those yeah no well i just like the fact that it is some that could in theory i have to say in theory be done for real in theory be done in practice um it is different from a lot of those attacks. So, like, I'm not a big fan of those attacks that do require direct access to the data itself being processed. Yeah, so that's kind of where, where I think this one's kind of different. Yes, in this paper, they do directly manipulate that data. I just think they do it in a fair way. You know, they're trying to simulate what you could really do. So I, I think that's fair. Like I said, you might get pulled over for some of the unsafe loads, but at the same time, you know, you're probably not doing this and just driving down the freeway for hours. It's probably, if you were Hoping going to, to use this, and yeah. I, I mean, I I don't know if any actual campaign or anything that would have done something like this. Like, I guess it wouldn't be a campaign, but like, I've never heard about <laughs> any sort of attack like this being done in the wild. Uh, like in, I just mean in general against the AI self-driving cars of this style. That isn't to say in the future we won't see it, but at this point, I don't know if that actually happening. Just get a regiment, like a full like team of people who just drive around with cars with tilted couches on the top, <laughs> trying to cause accidents on the freeway. Yep. There you go. Uh, new new malware campaign targeting uh targeting cars. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's definitely, it's more of a fun paper. Um, it does have some potential real world implications, but it's more just, uh, you know, fun in concept, the actual attack, like the math behind it and stuff isn't too interesting or too important. I don't think, uh, I think it's more just what you were saying with, uh, you know, the potential, like, um, of real world objects causing that. Yeah. I mean, it's, data it's still, like you said, it's a fun attack. It's a fun issue. Yeah. So we'll segue into some shout outs. Um, we have a shout out for another Microsoft breakdown, and it lays out an attack matrix for hitting uh, Kubernetes containers systems. Um, yeah, and I mean, we're not going to cover it. They do like the Mitri attack style breakdown of it. It's just a good reference. Uh, for, yeah, they have like the table of like a, a bunch of different attacker goals that you would go for. So like yeah, well, so that's access, the attack matrix, like the Mitri attack matrix. Yeah, it's kind of your goals and different attacks there. And yeah, it's just we talked about another breakdown. I think when we were talking about CFI or was it the ROP one? No, uh, must episode, must have been no. A, it was episode thirty-two, and we were talking about memory tagging. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they just kind of broke down kind of some of the attacks there. So I saw this and I was interested because it's another little breakdown. Obviously, this one is specifically a breakdown, whereas the other one, the breakdown was kind of just a tangent to the actual topic of the memory tagging. Um, yeah, the other one was more of an analysis. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I saw this though and figure some of you might find it might find it somewhat interesting to give a read over or to use it as a bit of a reference on a pen test. Yeah. So, yeah, so I like Microsoft's breakdowns. I like how they have, like, the gen general overview that's, like, really easy to understand up front. And then they have, like, those breakdowns further on if you want more information on any specific issue. I like that, like, style of breakdown. Microsoft does a good job with those. So Yeah, I think they did a good job here. They don't go, like, too far in in detail with anything. It is a very much an overview of different attack methods, different things you can be looking for. Not, not super specific most of the time. Not a guide. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I agree. I like it. Thus, yeah. it's a shout out. Uh, you also had another shout out with uh, Project Zero. Uh, yeah. Project Zero post. Yeah. I mean, we often end up talking about them. Uh, this one I didn't feel was quite worth actually discussing on the episode. Uh, but it's another post from Maddie Stone, who we've talked about her work on another, I want to say we talked about with uh, WhatsApp exploits, but um, yeah, she put out another post there. 
worth a read. It's an older vulnerability. That's why we're not going to cover it in depth. But if you don't already follow Project Zero, there's your alert. They have a new post out. Yeah, there you go. Um, I have a shout out. I, I saw this being mentioned. Uh, there was a frack paper for the first time in a little while. I think the last frack paper was in February, maybe. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, so paper, part of their paper feed. Yeah. Uh, although I didn't so, notice, actually, when I went to the homepage of Frack to go pull this off, that they do have a call for papers uh, that, as far as I know, is somewhat recent. And I don't think Frack dropped an actual zine since 16, I want to say, was their last one. Yeah, I think it's been a while. So, yeah, they're looking for papers. I'm not sure how long ago they put up the CFP or if maybe I... Maybe I should have looked at that, but uh. yeah, we'll go through the Wayback Machine, get a get a timestamp. <laughs> but um, yeah, this frack paper specifically, uh, it talks about bugs that um, this researcher found in the FreeBSD Beehive hypervisor, um, which you know I don't think I've I've seen much about. I, I don't think it's like very popular, but you know anything with hypervisors and stuff is always fun to look at because of how low level it is. Um, and uh, one of the bugs is in the VGA emulation subsystem, and it's an out of bounds access on palette memory um, via integer overflow. And th that memory is used for like pixel entries for um, DAC address read and write mode registers. And the problem is they end up using 32 bit indexes uh, when they should have been 8 bit indexes because only values of 2 to 256 are expected, and the wraparound is expected on that too. But because they use integers instead of uh, chars or uint eights, um, you could actually end up reading or writing out of bounds. And because you get those two, both read and write, those two primitives together are very powerful because you can use that to both leak and corrupt heap data. Um, the other bugs seem to be unrelated. It was a bug in the firmware configuration device, uh, which allows the guests to retrieve host provided information like the virtual CPU count, for example. And it's kind of similar to the first issue. Uh, it's assigned in this issue in one of the request structures. So something that should have been unsigned is treated as signed. And because of that, um, there's a discrepancy between the allocation and the copy length, and you end up getting an overflow. So this article goes through all the technical details of both vulnerabilities and uh, how the first one can get code execution. The second one, they don't go as far as code execution. They get arbitrary read-write. But, you know, like I was saying earlier, arbitrary read write is super powerful. You can get code execution from that if you take it further. Yeah, and um, one thing I did I, find... I wanted to give it a... One thing I did find interesting with this one is they do also talk about needing to bypass or deal with CFI uh, and uh, doing ROP in that... Or, well, obviously CFI isn't blocking your ROP, but uh, they do talk about CFI as, you know, end, uh, ending up pushing them towards needing to do ROP. Uh, which that was just interesting little reminder there that yeah CFI is coming. That said, you know th there are ways around it. We've had a little bit. I won't say doom and gloom. I think we've because we've talked about bypassing it a few times. But you know it, it's just it'll be like ASLR and DAP. Uh, it'll stop some exploits, but naturally, you know we're we'll find ways around it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I thought it was just interesting, real world and looking at uh, getting around safe stack, getting around CFI. Yeah. So, you know, I really wanted to shout this out just because um, when you're talking about like exploiting at the hypervisor level, resources are a lot more scarce for that compared to other, you know, like web exploitation or uh, just, you know, higher level binary exploitation. So, and and the frack papers are generally like pretty good. Like their vetting process is awesome. So yeah, and I will that mention come out of frack are are worth reading. I will mention on that actually that CFP seventy um, has actually been up since like twenty sixteen. So definitely not new. Oh okay, fair enough. Um, and then Z, you had another shout out with uh, you want to be a web security researcher. Yeah, um, and this is an older thing. Actually, apparently it was updated just last month, but it's from like 2018. I just first came across it recently. And I know we have some people who do like the bug bounties and more web stuff. Um, and I thought, I since I just came across this, I thought it was a really good write-up of going about actually getting into the research, not just repeating what everybody else has done, but getting into actually doing some new research. Um, and I think it actually applies more generally. It's while it talks specifically about web stuff, uh, 
Yeah, it has advice about, like, if you come across a good quality blog post, read the entire archive that will, you know, maybe help you find some forgotten tidbits and using that older information to build off of that, find, or, yeah, it actually mentions here, hunt for forgotten knowledge, uh, no ideas too stupid, things like that. It, it's a good write-up, even if you're not, not necessarily going to do web stuff, I think it's still relevant, or you could still apply a lot of this. To just security research in general uh and yeah it's older but since i just came across it i figured i'd give it a mention yeah for sure cool uh so that pretty much you know includes all of our topics we'll wrap up the show here uh thanks to everyone who tuned in uh it was cool to get anti on for like that you know 30 minutes that he was on for a bit it's again been a, yeah it's been a it's while it's been a long time since he's been on so um, but yeah, you can catch the VODs on Twitch or on YouTube 24 hours after the stream. We also have previous podcast episodes up on Spotify, Apple Podcast, uh, and more links on Anchor and stuff like that. Uh, you can join our Discord or follow us on Twitter if you want to get involved with the community. Uh, that being said, uh, we'll be back again next Monday at the same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. And we will say, see you guys then.